But um, let me get to something of the word. We, I'm talking about reclaiming and delighting in life. And, uh, and so last week I, I started to, to kind of the first part of this sermon. It was going to be all one sermon and then I just realized this is not going to fly. Um, and now maybe a couple of weeks about rediscovering, reclaiming, and delighting ourselves in kingdom living, in living the life that God gave us. So the foundation that I'm building on is, is rather simple. It's not rocket science. It's, um, it really is quite simple. 2020, if you can think back, it's not that far ago, 2020 was supposed to be the year of perfect vision. 2020 vision, the year of perfect vision, 2020. We actually call it that. And then it became the year of the blurred future. <laughs> that would have been a a better name. It became the year of the lockdown, of COVID, of protocols, and an entirely new normal. In fact, if we look back, it became uh, the introduction of an entirely new abnormal. Because if society behaves abnormally for long enough, it becomes the new norm. And so what we are saying, and I'm, I'm, please don't hear what I'm not saying, is what I am saying, is that um, we were actually caught a bit off guard, I think, because for most of us, it was sold as a three-week holiday. Uh, this, this, we're going to go into hard lockdown, we're going to prepare the hospitals and so on, and, and then everything's going to be back to normal. And um, now it's kind of lingering. It's 2022, and uh, this pandemic is lingering, and as I said last week, it's giving our coffee shop linger a bad name. And so what is left now, it has gone through different phases and different levels, and what, what is left, I think, my opinion, is, is the caution. Um, as we still tell Sean, you don't lick doorknobs or toilet seats and stuff. There's still a caution. There's still some, uh, some f- protocols. There's, there's t- often quite a lot of frustration that is left. And the one thing that hasn't left is the uncertainty. Because anything can happen at any stage, it would seem. And so everything has been placed on hold or can be postponed or, or cancelled. Um, looking at, at the, the last year or two, just, just think of some of the major things that you were looking forward to that, that had to be either postponed or cancelled. Possibly your holiday, your overseas trip, um, but, but major world things like the Olympics, uh, the Tour de France. Tour de France has been running for more than, more than 100 years, and suddenly I think for the first time ever the Tour de France was cancelled. It wasn't even cancelled during World War II. Although, as far as I know, the Olympics was. So um, the uncertainty, this uncertainty actually caused huge cost, um, financial cost, the, the restraints, catastrophic economic impact. Industries, especially specific industries like the hospitality industry, a lot of them just folded. Um, and it added to, well, adding to that, the, the corruption involved really led to a terrible, blurred future. So what was supposed to be the time, the year, the season, the decade of perfect vision became the time of a blurred future. And so the the problem with that is that no longer do we hope, no longer do we dream, no longer do we plan and do we prepare ourselves because what's the point? All of those dreams, plans, planning, preparations, all of that can go up in smoke in a fairly short televised speech aimed at me and my fellow South Africans. And who knows what follows that. Um, again, with, with love and respect. So this situation, the situation of uncertainty has literally drained the color of life out of us as we know it. And so one of the points that I want to make now is that uh, if we take away the hope of the future, and that's why I chatted to, to that group this morning, if we take away the hope of the future, what is left is gray hamster wheeling in the present. Because where, where am I going? I'm, I, I don't know. I don't know what, what next year holds. More of this, more of the same stuff. So if we take away the hope, the excitement, the vision, the purpose of the future, we are left with gray hamster wheel spinning in the present. Just please make sure that your hamster wheel is properly sanitized. The thing is, for many, this has not only dulled our sense of life and our sense of excitement for life, 
but it's actually also had an impact on your spiritual life. It's had a, a, a dulling, kind of wet blankety effect on our spiritual life, on our walk with God. And that's why I'm on this theme. I'm not on this theme because I'm an anti this or an anti this or pro that or that. I'm on this theme of re claiming and rediscovering the beauty of life and delighting myself in life and in God because I believe it's time to rediscover the greatness of life and the life giver because it's, it's just been on, on pause for too long. So I believe it's time to kind of reassess what level I have allowed outside circumstances to affect my inner life? To what level have I personally allowed, because it's choices, society and what happens there and the external factors and the circumstances to affect and to put a damper on my personal inner life and to reclaim that life? When, when I was thinking of that and preparing, I, I couldn't at this moment help but be reminded of Gideon. You will remember Gideon as one of the judges in Judges chapter 6, and Israel was really under pressure from uh, Midian. And um, so we find Gideon is hiding in a wine press, which is literally a hole in the ground, and he is trying to thresh out some, some wheat. So he wants to kind of try and save a, a few handsful of, of wheat for his family. That's the kind of situation that, that he was in, and it kind of just reminded me of now. And for him, if you don't know the story well, just go and check it up in, in Judges chapter 6. But I believe for us, just like for him, it's time to hear the voice of God again, to look up out of this hole that he found himself in, and to listen to the, the, the Word of God for each one of us individually. It was an individual word to him in his circumstances, and that word was, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. So I want to repeat, right at this point, it's almost an, as an analogy that we look up as the angel appeared, he heard the voice, he had to look up a voice for him individually, and in his circumstances, he wasn't suddenly beamed up to an oasis in a hotel, and was, the, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And so, yes, we still have to follow some protocol, protocols, but I do not have to follow the crowd. I might have to follow some rules, follow some protocols, but I do not have to follow the crowd. I can actually take my life back. I can rediscover the beauty of life, the wonder of life, and I can and I should delight myself in life. I think growing old is great. It definitely beats dying young. Just, just my opinion. So, um, where are we? And then, then we find ourselves in, in Judges 6, 14. The Lord turned to Gideon and said, Go in the strength that you have. Am I not sending you? And that, I think, is a a message in itself for this morning. Go in the strength that you have, am I not sending you? So I have a, a video clip that uh, might puzzle you a bit, but maybe you'll enjoy it. And when the safari season in Africa is cancelled, one deadly hunter rewrites the rule book. This luxury lodge stands empty. But it doesn't take long before new guests begin to check in. Vervet monkeys reserve a spot by the pool. while impala and nyala antelope take advantage of the salad bar. But not far behind, a fully grown male leopard.
the appearance during the day of this usually nocturnal hunter is a real surprise, not least for our film crew. Just nice little guys. I've had some intimidating moments in my life, but that is at the top of it. Across Africa, leopards have lost over 60% of their territory to people, making hunting ever more challenging. But here, with no guests around, this leopard sees an opportunity and makes a remarkable switch in his behavior. He starts hunting during the day. It may take a few attempts, but it's not long before his new strategy pays off. Leopard numbers in Africa have dropped by over 30% in the last 25 years. But by taking full advantage of this new all-you-can-eat lockdown buffet, this leopard is thriving. This pretty much has become his lodge, his private kingdom. So in all the craziness, there's opportunity. That's pretty much the point of the video. So I hope that was a, a helpful introduction. Taking back life. Reclaiming life. Let's, let's move on. Uh, I want to, as that as is kind of the background, I want to encourage us firstly, if you, haven't, if you weren't part of last week and uh, you couldn't listen to the, the message, please listen to it online. We looked, on, we, we looked at uh, delighting myself in my salvation and delighting myself in the nature of God. Delighting myself in my salvation and the nature of God. Today I'm going to talk about delighting myself in the fact that I'm a new creation. Okay, so I delight myself in the fact that by grace I'm no longer the person that I used to be before. Before I surrendered my life. To Christ. My response to the grace of God is to shun my sinful desires, my sinful nature, because I've found a new object of desire that is worthy of both my worship and my obedience, the Lord Jesus Christ. Worthy of both worship and obedience. Paul writes, he says, therefore, if anyone, this is 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation, the old is gone, the new has come. However, Gideon, whom we spoke about earlier, the Lord appears to Gideon, and he says to him, Arise, mighty warrior. He then says to him, but there's a couple of things that you actually have to go and do. Gideon had to go and clean up his private life. He had to go back home and clean up a bit. And so the Lord said to him in Judges chapter 6, 25 to 26, that same night the Lord said to him, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old, tear down, tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down, cut down the Asherah pole beside it. And then you take the wood of the Asherah pole and you chop it up and you build a proper altar to the Lord using the wood of the Asherah pole that you've cut down. You sacrifice this bull to the Lord, a proper sacrifice. You see, becoming a new creation, 
The old is gone, the new is come. Becoming a new creation, there's two parts of that. There, there's salvation, there's the, the, the moment, the instant of salvation, of justification, but then there's also the process part of holiness, of becoming Christ-like, of sanctification, which is a process, and that process actually includes and involves some tearing down, some going home, tearing down, some cutting down, some sacrificing, and then building up a new proper kind, as it says, of altar to the Lord. John Piper wrote, he said, Obedience is the irrepressible public relations project of all those who have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. Obedience is the irrepressible public relations uh, project of all those who have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. We live, our Christianity is to be lived for the fame of His name. And so by our example, we give Christianity and Christ a good name. Matthew wrote, In the same way, let your light shine so before men that they may see your good works and delight in and glorify, praise your Father in heaven. Paul said in Romans 6, What then shall we do? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? It by no means. No, you see, grace actually leads me to obedience. Grace is not, or grace is opposed to dead works and to lifeless legalism and laws. Grace is not opposed to obedience. Jesus said, Matthew 14, 15, if you love me, you will obey me. If you love me, you'll obey my commands. If you love me, you will do what I say by grace. There isn't more law. And so the fact is, that the next point is that it's not this, this, this new creation that I'm delighting myself in is not by law. It's not through religion. But I actually, in time, as I walk this, this road, I start to delight myself because I can actually see the, the small changes, the, these small changes that over time add up to a whole new me, a, a different person, producing a different person, reflecting the one in whose image I've been created. And that's, that's absolutely huge. I delight in the work of the Holy Spirit in me. I'm delighting in what He is doing inside of me. It's a huge key. The work of the Holy Spirit inside of me is a huge key to reclaiming the wonder and the beauty of life. And I delight myself in the fact that this has absolutely nothing to do with religion. It's not a new list of do's and don'ts, but it flows from a surrendered heart. Paul has described it to the Galatian churches as follows, Galatians 6, 14 to 15, he says, May I never boast in anything but the cross of Jesus Christ, through which the world was crucified to me and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision, in other words, no outward actions, no outward appearance or, or pretense means anything. What counts is a new creation. So following a, a set of rules, of laws, of traditions is mere religious hamster wheeling. It's religious spinning the hamster wheel. And it's not what Jesus came to give. They all had the law and religion and their little hamster wheels already. No, Jesus came to take that away and to give them life, to give them grace, to give them a delight as they taste and see that the Lord is good. For them to come into freedom, that is why he came. Christ came for freedom, for grace, for life. So as we move on, I'm delighted that this new me is all about God in me and God and me. I'm not in competition with anybody else. I'm not comparing my walk with God with anybody else. I'm not trying to catch up to anybody else. I'm not looking over my shoulder, seeing whether I'm ahead of anybody else. No, actually, as incredible as it may seem, 
I'm on a journey with the creator of the universe. The one who spoke the universe into being, who calls out the stars by name, walks an individual, personal, by name, walk with me. I'm not just added to the pile of new believers. Who's seen Ratatouille? If you haven't seen Ratatouille, get a life. Go and see Ratatouille. I mean, it's, it's a story about an animated rat that cooks. How can that not be brilliant? <laughs> okay, so in Ratatouille, his brother Emile finds some exquisite cheese. And Hemi, Remy, Remy sees this and he says, what have you got there? He says, I don't know, some sort of cheese. He says, what are you going to do with it? He says, I don't know, throw it on the pile, I guess. You know, the, so all the rats come together, they, they scurry around for food all day, and then they chuck it all on the pile, and tonight they have a, whatever, a feast from diapers to strawberries, you know, whatever they found. And Remy's so shocked, he said, you can't throw this on the pile. This is special. We have to cook this. And, okay, the rest is really good. Because they go up onto the roof, and they wait for the lightning in any event. Um, that's, that's the irrelevant, irrelevant part. The relevant part is, we, when, we get, when, when we connect to God, when we receive Him, He doesn't just add our name to the pile of believers. We are not just all herded together by the angels and say, all the believers this way, and at a kind of nice and easy, gentle pace, herded towards heaven at a steady pace. With all the other believers. No, I get to walk a road with God individually. Like the two friends that were on their route to Emmaus, God comes alongside of me and He unpacks this new life that He has for me. And as He does it, my heart starts to burn with excitement within me. It's like Enoch walked with God. Genesis chapter 5, it says, Enoch walked with God 300 years. It was a long road, 27 years to freedom here. Enoch walked with God for 300 years. He had sons and daughters, and altogether, Enoch lived for 365 years. And Enoch walked with God, and then he was no more because God took him. But I love those two identical phrases, and Enoch walked with God. I just absolutely love that. I get to walk with God. So in celebrating the fact that I'm a new creation, I'm living out my sonship. I'm living out my daughtership. I'm actually starting to be again. I'm, I'm being human. I'm planning. I'm doing. I'm living again. I'm working from sonship, not for sonship. Did I really use the W word? Did I say working? Yes, I did. Because in Ephesians 2, from 8 to 10, it says the following. It is by grace that you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourself. It's a, it's a gift of God. It's not by work so that no one can boast. And then the, the punchline from kind of the uppercut, which you didn't expect. For we are God's workmanship, His craftsmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. It's not by works, but it's to, good, to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. So becoming a new creation in Christ does not remove me from the reality and places me on cloud nine where I can gracefully float at, what, 18 20 degrees, what would you prefer? Um, float towards heaven. Remove from all reality. Remove from everything else. No, no, it actually, when I'm connected to him, when I receive his life, it actually awakens me. And it awakens me not only to my own reality, but it also awakens me to the world around me and to the realities of others, to their dreams, and to their hopes, and to their fears. It awakens me to those around me. I become aware my world expands. I start to notice. I start to 
include others. I start to become involved in their lives graciously, lovingly, kindly, not religiously. Even in, no, especially during a pandemic. Individual, an individual walk with God, but not an exclusive walk with God. An individual walk with God, but an inclusive walk with God. The exact opposite, unfortunately, has been happening lately. And that's why I'm on this passionate call for us to reclaim and, re and find life. When, during this pandemic, the, suddenly we found a world fenced in, locked in, blocked in, Looking out often only for ourselves and my family and our safety and our health. Exactly the opposite of, of what we were called to. And so often we, we tend to, as Christians, just listen to Christian music and do Christian things and read Christian books and mingle with other Christians. And so we find that we become hugely and utterly ineffective to reach the rest of the world. And yes, yes, we, we gave as a, as, a, as a people and as a church, we gave generously when we had the recent floods. Really, we did. And, and we continue to give generously um, and to help the poor, etc. We've Just last week, we, we saw photos during the, um, during the announcements of uh, what took place at, towards the end of last year of how we generously gave. And I want to thank you for that. But sometimes it's still kind of at arm's length where I, I put an offering in or I... So, in, and it's, it's taken on, on, kind of on my behalf. But if you look at Jesus, he was so incredibly inclusive. He, he was, if we just page through the Gospels again, just look at how inclusive his nature and his, his not only his message was, but his life was. He was found sitting at a well, chatting to an adulterous, Samaritan female. I don't even want to start comparing that today. He reached out and he touched and then healed lepers. He loved children. And he hung out with what the, what the Bible called notorious sinners. Not just the normal sinners, the notorious sinners, and Afrikaans opperste stonte. Notorious sinners in English. He was anointed by a prostitute. I'm talking about the inclusivity. Those who were possessed by demons ran to him. A thousand demons, and he runs to Jesus. Not a thousand demons can cause him to run away from Jesus. The inclusivity, the mag magnetism of who the Christ was and is that draws us into this wonderful life. Isn't it fortunate that there wasn't a pandemic at that time that it would have stopped Jesus in his tracks? Whew. Perhaps it's time for all of us to pop our little social bubbles to come out of hiding and to become aware of those around of us again. To become aware of life around us again and the circumstances around us. To represent Him well in an inclusive way. And in this way, as we do this, naturally do the good works which He has prepared in advance for us to do. Religiously? <laughs> no, 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 no. Bravely, but lovingly, kindly, graciously, and gently. Lastly, the world at its worst is desperate for a church at its best. Remember in Judges chapter 6 verse 14, the Lord said to Gideon, Go in the strength that you have. Am I not sending you? What a delightfully scary, challenging 
mission he has sent us on. You know, the, the, the wonderful thing about this, this kingdom living, kingdom journey, is that as we step out on it and as we move and we start to live and become more and more aware of that which is happening around us, and as we step into those worlds and into those circumstances, we start to live with an increasing expectation of life. Instead of the gray hamster wheel treading, we actually start to live with an increasing expectation of life. I expect more from life. I expect life to be great. I expect to wake up tomorrow morning saying, Woo, I feel good. I knew that I would now, even if it's Monday. Not in a demanding way. Not in an entitled way. I expect more from life. The world owes me more from life. No, no. As I change my attitude towards life, and I start to expect more from life, and I involve myself more in life. The wonderful that happens is I start to experience more from life. So can I ask and challenge you to expect more from this God-given life so that you can experience more of the God-given life. I realize that my life has purpose, it has value, it has meaning, and that takes me out of mere existence, takes me out of mere survival, out of the rut, out of the hamster wheel treading, out of the mundane, out of the frustration of protocols and uncertainty about the future, and it places me right in the middle of the abundant life that Jesus Christ came to give us. If we move out and reclaim the life that Christ died to give you and me. Amen. It is 